Hello, this is Fred Sesti. I'm a nurse practitioner here at West Tennessee Healthcare Thompson Farms Clinic in Jackson, Tennessee. And today we're on We Talk Health Podcast. And joining me is Dr. Claude Pertle. He is a internal medicine trained physician from LSU and has a fellowship from Vanderbilt University. Welcome, Dr. Pertle. Oh, thank you very much, Fred. I'm excited to be here and uh, appreciate your time and setting all this up. Absolutely. Glad to have you. So today we're talking about diabetes and uh, we're going to explain the different types of diabetes and uh, how to diagnose it, symptoms of diabetes, who's at risk, and uh, risk factors associated with diabetes. So Dr. Pertle, can you give us a little uh, brief overview of the different types of diabetes that are out there. Absolutely. Thank you, Fred. I just want to say thank you again for putting this together in West Tennessee Healthcare. I actually am a physician uh, in primary care and urgent care down at the Lyft, uh, which is in downtown Jackson. Um, and I just want to talk about literally what is diabetes, right? So it's really a group of disorders characterized by an inability of the body to regulate the blood glucose levels. It's really a metabolic disorder. When you think of diabetes, you think of the, the big two or type one and type two diabetes, but there's also gestational diabetes. Uh, just to break those down a little bit further, especially type one and two, uh, type 1 used to be called, quote-unquote, uh, juvenile onset diabetes. And really, it, was, it results from the autoimmune destruction of the insulin-producing cells in your pancreas. So basically, you just run out of insulin, essentially. Type 2 diabetes is probably the most well-known, especially now. Uh, it's basically when your pancreas does not make enough insulin, or really your body uh, becomes insulin-resistant. So your body is not able to use that insulin properly. And just to kind of go a little, one step further, as most some people may be asking, like, well, what is insulin? Well, insulin is a hormone in your body. Uh, it's actually a peptide hormone produced in the pancreas, as we mentioned, um, that allows your body to basically take in that glucose and use it for energy. So all those muscle cells and things like that are able to use that uh, glucose for energy to help you run, jump, et cetera, throughout your day. Absolutely. Yeah. So I got to explain to my patients that the, the insulin is that key, like kind of a lock and key mechanism to get the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the muscles where it needs to be utilized and for energy and, and metabolism and such. So we don't want, uh, we do talk in terms of glucose or sugar sure. a lot when we're treating our diabetic patients. Uh, we don't want that glucose in those, uh, in the bloodstream or capillaries or the small vessels damaging our body and causing the damage, you know, where it's in the eyes or the kidneys yep, or yep. the heart or those small vessels elsewhere. Uh, so You got it. And, and it's with, with those type 2 diabetics, I mean, essentially, uh, the receptors really aren't working that well. And as you mentioned, in your body just becomes desensitized. So you need more and more insulin due to adipose tissue or whatever else to really get inside the cells and really help your body so you're able to jump and run and do whatever else you need. And absolutely. Exercise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's what we want people to do is uh, to be active. And one of the things, you know, with between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, you know, Type 1s are totally dependent upon insulin and rarely use any other medications that you may see, you know, the public may be see advertised on television out there targeting diabetes. So the majority of our population, of course, has type 2 diabetes and a smaller portion has type 1 diabetes for sure. Absolutely. So give us some numbers, you know, like the impact of, of diabetes, the cost of uh, treating diabetes, you know, with some of the numbers that we we have out there? Sure. Well, I guess just looking back, I mean, some of the stats, uh, uh, these are actually from 2012. I I didn't pull the latest, but it's still very true now, actually probably worse. Uh, Really, the total annual cost of diabetes is around $245 billion. And uh, this is about $176 billion direct cost, and then $69 billion in indirect cost. Indirect being uh, absenteeism from work, things like that, needing extra time off, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a large issue. And it's really it's at epidemic proportions right now, and nearly 29 million Americans living with the disease, and an additional 86 million, uh, and this is in 2012, 2013, have, uh, are thought to have prediabetes, which is up from about 2010, when it had 79 million people. And really, this is a huge issue because obviously, as, as we're going to talk about very shortly, it's just kind of the chronic conditions and the other issues, higher increased mortality with heart issues, kidney issues, eye vision issues, things like that. Uh, it's really an all-around epidemic, and it's, it's hitting the United States in multiple different uh, ways. Absolutely. Yeah, it really puts a strain on our healthcare system. Our patients with diabetes can uh, certainly have are more risk for infections, more complicated infections. They don't heal as quickly. And certainly diabetes is the number one cause of kidney failure, amputations, and blindness in the U.S., 
absolutely and elsewhere so so again a major strain on our health care system and it's very difficult sometimes for these people to heal uh, as far as if they get a wound uh, it takes longer for them to heal rather than if they did not have diabetes you're very right and looking at i mean all of those things essentially it, it, healing and it just takes the process a lot longer to do anything in general absolutely yeah so what are some of the, the symptoms of, you know, risk factors, rather, of diabetes? Well, so some of the risk factors are uh, really, any, let's, I guess your question let's just point a little bit more to, like, who, who needs to be screened, really, I right. guess is what you're asking. And just so people can have something to look out for. Uh, so really anybody with hypertension and um, a BMI greater than 30, there's actually some at-risk groups, such as Native Americans, uh, some Hispanics people, and other uh, individuals are also at risk. Anyone who has a really sedentary lifestyle, and also, or even a family history, uh, but really anyone over the age of 45 really should be screened for diabetes at least once. Uh, and, and this is a simple blood glucose test. Uh, we're talking like a little finger stick in the, any doctor's office, any urgent care, really wherever. And just check the, that glucose to make sure it's a reasonable number at the time. And because this is something that we can definitely stay on top of and take control over if we know about it. Because as hypertension is, it's kind of a nickname, the silent killer, because nobody ever knows about their hypertension until it's too late, typically, That's right. uh, for, that it really damages people, their kidneys and not uh, whatnot. But uh, also diabetes is the same situation. And if we know about it, we can definitely help that individual improve their lifestyle and improve through medications or just through their uh, activities in daily life. That, that's exactly right. Yeah, so they could change their lifestyle so that they could prevent some of the bad things from happening once they're diagnosed with diabetes. Also, you know, they may be in a, a pre-diabetic state and they can make some serious lifestyle changes where they can prevent the trend to developing full-blown diabetes. Absolutely. Uh, so that's good information for the patient to know and how to take care of themselves. And I think just to point out too, so pre-diabetes is really, you're not diabetic quite yet. And this is just an arbitrary cutoff by the ADA. But I think at any point, I just want to make sure that our listeners know that you can, you can turn this around. Just because you're never, quote unquote, too far gone. You could always make your lifestyle better. You can stop smoking. You can in- decrease the weight. You can do whatever it takes. And you can really turn around a lot of those complications of diabetes and improve it. Right. That's so important because if you don't do anything about that, then you, you know, your trend towards being diabetic or uncontrolled diabetic uh, disease or diabetes, and you have all these complications. So if you're in a pre-diabetic state, then that is the time to make serious lifestyle changes and become more active, uh, exercising regularly, eating healthy, adding more whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, limiting your caloric intake. And it's not just about sugar. It's just about the quality of food that you eat as well. And that makes an impact. And as providers, we're here to help you. We don't want you to be on all these medications if you don't need to be. We want you to be healthy and and have a very prosperous uh, lifestyle and make significant lifestyle changes. Absolutely. I'd like to just talk, touch on some of the symptoms that you could potentially look for uh, and really push those people to get tested or at least t- take, talk to with your doctor. This is a great conversation to have with your provider, whomever it is. Uh, symptoms that you're looking for in those groups, of course. So increased thirst or you feel like you're urinating a lot, always tired, uh, increased healing time, which we kind of alluded to in this, uh, a few minutes ago, actually, mm-hmm. also. Blurry vision, unexplained weight loss. Um, numbness, increased pain in you know bilateral extremities, uh, or even in your hands also. And these are all kind of just uh, points that maybe like, hey, let me, if you have never been tested, maybe just next time you're at the doctor's office, just ask him to test you if he hasn't already. Absolutely. And I've seen this in my years of clinical practice. The most common would be somebody that comes in that does not know they have diabetes and they have quite a bit of profound fatigue. They just don't feel good, blurry vision, drinking a lot. Uh, as far as very thirsty and drinking a lot of water, then you're urinating a lot. And then the numbness on their the bottoms of their feet, typically. And sure enough, we check them and they have a blood sugar that's very high. So you know, let's touch on what a normal blood sugar should be for someone without diabetes and what is diagnostic of diabetes. And we're talking about, you know, how to diagnose this. Absolutely. No, this is a great point. So typically you can think, this is to make it easy, uh, blood sugar should be 100 to 110 typically. Now this is depends on when you when you take it during the day, did you eat a large carb load? You know, there's a lot of questions in there, but that's kind of a guide. Um, right now there's really three ways to diagnose diabetes. Um, fasting blood glucose levels. So as we mentioned, kind of normal is around 100. 
uh, pre-diabetes, so after you haven't eaten anything um, for a, at least almost eight hours, actually they say six to eight hours, uh, if, if your blood sugar is over 126, that's typically considered as a you're diabetic. Or if you're between 100 and 125, actually 110 to 125, it's quote-unquote pre-diabetes. Also, you can do an oral glucose tolerance test. And those same kind of numbers change a little bit, obviously. And this one would you take? This is when you take uh, a 75 gram oral glucose load, and then you check your blood glucose about two hours after. But probably the most popular, and I'm sure you've seen it done every day, okay. uh, multiple times a day, is a hemoglobin A1C level. And normal with that is 5.7, uh, less than 5.7, really. Pre-diabetic is considered 5.7 to 6.4. Then any, pretty much anything over 6.5 is considered diabetic. Now, this is a little different when it comes to someone with end-stage renal disease and things like that, because this is actually measuring a three-month average of your uh, of glycosylated blood cells. So it's kind of an average of that sugar around those blood cells, right. and that's what we really use. And, and it's mostly used because it's easy. It's just a blood test that you add on to a comprehensive metabolic panel, whatever right. it is, and it just you, it's an easy uh, number just to remember. Yeah. So, uh, and I'll explain to my patients, I say, you know, a blood glucose is your snapshot right that moment of what that sugar is doing and what that number or level is. And then a hemoglobin A1C, we talk in those terms, it's not resulted in the same number as glucose, but it's more of a timeline. So it's a period of time over the last several months of what your blood sugar has been doing, more of an average blood sugar level in percentage points. Uh, that's that's an so. awesome point, Fred. I mean, and just kind of showing that people, like, hey, this is what it looks like over the last three months of your life. And this that's is right. it, just because you had a candy bar two hours ago. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. That's not going to really change it at all. So my patients that come in and uh, know they're coming to see you or I, and they, uh, oh, I'm, I'm going to eat really healthy the, the next forty eight hours. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to go see uh, go see the doc and uh, get my blood level checked. So my A one C is not going to tell off on me, but. Yes, it really does. So you're right, you're it, right. it will let us know if uh, things have been bad and you've been overeating or eating all the wrong stuff. So. And again, and those are easy tests we all do here in the office. The A1C or hemoglobin A1C is also how we measure control of diabetes as well. So uh, it is a, often used in regular practice. And, uh, you know, we rely on that test quite a lot to determine how well someone is has diabetes under control or uncontrolled. Absolutely. Yeah, like you mentioned, exactly, you're, you're dead on. Uh, just kind of, it's, it's used as a kind of that marker itself, especially when you get to treatment of diabetes, if it is by weight loss or maybe you're further down with some type of medication, uh, such as metformin or even insulin further down, uh, it's really a marker of how you're doing and how your blood sugar is being controlled over the last, like you mentioned, three months. Yeah, Absolutely. So let's talk about some things people can do if they have these risk factors. So they've got a, a mother or father that had diabetes or a brother or sister, maybe one or two relatives. We know and uh, our experience that someone that has two relatives or two first degree relatives, they're a very high risk of developing diabetes. So let's talk about some things that they could do. What could they do and how could they take care of themselves? Sure. Well, I guess I'll point out that this is it's pretty much for type 2 diabetes specifically, Absolutely. just because type 1 is more insulin-based. You you need insulin. That, that's a that autoimmune correct. disorder. But type 2, really, what to pay attention to the most is really having a healthy lifestyle, like you mentioned before. Probably first line, even when most physicians or, or providers are going to see you, is really that first line, like, hey, I need you to, you know, how, how's your exercise look? And what are you eating? Are you eating uh, refined foods? Uh, are you eating candy? Are you eating this and that, drinking Cokes, doing this? Um, or what does it look like? And let me help you decide, let me help you design your diet a little bit better. And there's actually lo- lots of nutritionists out there that are with Western Sea, actually, yeah. uh, that would love to do that and really help you define a diet that you can do every day. Now, this is not pointing out you have to eat only grilled chicken every day of your life. Uh, that, that, <laughs> but, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And tapping in to the knowledge of your provider. Getting referred to a, a dietitian is going to yep. be helpful. But if you have these risk factors, then eating healthy is going to play a, have a major impact on how you feel and your risk of diabetes as well. So that's more fruits and vegetables, whole grain foods. Absolutely. Limiting your fast food, sodas and sugary beverages, of course. You know, junk food, parts, packaged food and processed food. It's like our body really has to work really hard to break down those packaged foods and processed foods and use them for energy. 
I always like to think about it. Does it come from the ground? Would, would your yeah. would your great great grandpa eat this? Uh, and that's the best way to think of it. And granted, there's some exceptions to that, obviously. But really, discussing that diet and also this, the exercise piece too is really important because uh, just being active. And we're not talking that you have to go to the the gym and lift, you know, deadlift 450 pounds with your uh, the uncle that used to be a football player. We're that's talking right, about yeah. just just get out there, walk for an hour, and it really in. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but go. You can go to the mall don't bring your wallet so you don't buy anything right. but you can just walk around <laughs> actually you can if you want to but not <laughs> but the thing is just walk in the nice air conditioned area so mm-hmm. you're getting some exercise you're with your friends so you're doing something social or with your you know kids whichever it is right. and really doing that for at least 30 minutes to an hour a day or maybe every other day whenever you can is really helpful and really gets that exercise in and uh, yeah. helps your body, uh, body blood glucose level absolutely so the minimum recommendations would be some type of cardiovascular exercise of at least 150 minutes per week minimum. Yep. If you want to do more, then that's Go always for better for you. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. So it's going to affect your uh, glucose metabolism. It's going to co- affect your uh, blood pressure as well. And it's going to affect your cognition. You're going to feel better. And it's going to affect your bones and joints, and uh, you're going to move better as well. You, you are absolutely right, Fred. I mean, I, we, I can't say this enough, is that you, this is not just for the metabolic issues. This, this can affect your, your hypertension. This can affect your, your sleep. This can affect pretty much anything you can, you can think of, especially with your body. Um, and I, I would just want to caution before I would still crawl before you, you run, I guess is my point. Uh, make right. sure you, you walk first. Make sure your body's used to walking for, you know, like you mentioned, 30 minutes a day, things like that. Before, I, I guess my point is don't jump off the couch and start running marathons. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that's always just, dangerous. Leads to more injury. So you got to yes, work, yep. work your way up to absolutely. that. Gradually absolutely. increase your activity. And again, get outside, get away from the home uh, so that you're focused on some type of exercise that you're doing. Our last podcast, we talked about exercise as medicine, and they have great benefits there as well if you want to choose to go to a fitness uh, facility. But walking is always the best and uh, really uh, clears the mind as well. So. Yeah, just I would talk to your provider, whichever, uh, just to make sure he's, you know, everything's online with that. But also, I think he would be able to give you a lot of good, he or she would give you a lot of good tips. Uh, also, the dietitian would help out a lot. Also. Absolutely. So it's always, uh, when we were talking about diabetes, we've got a team approach here. And uh, I tell my patients that say, hey, we're on the same team here. I want you to be as healthy as possible, you know, because you're going to feel better. And, uh, you know, you have to communicate to me, you know, if there's a problem with, uh nutrition or a food allergy or some type of exercise limitation or even an issue with your medicines, you know, or your medications, you know, not able to get them or insurance wouldn't cover them or tolerability issues or many of those things. So those are all important things that we have to discuss, you know, at each visit and you know, most patients need to be open and, and that's a great point. Too. And just be just be transparent with your provider. Like, look, if you right. can't afford the medication, that's perfectly fine. There is a slew of other medications out there to change or, or whatever it takes to get you on the right track. Um, and I just kind of want to, and the question you brought up initially was, why would you even do this, right? So, you know, diabetes is bad, but really, really what does it cause? You know, what can happen to you? Mm-hmm. Well, just this increase your stroke risk, um, actually hospitalized Rates for stroke are about one and a half times higher for adults with diabetes. Your cardiovascular risk is about 1.7 times higher than among other adults without diabetes. You have a higher chance of having vision issues, kidney issues. I think I read one one statistic that uh, I think it was a few years ago. Anyway, diabetes was listed as a primary cause of kidney failure in over 40% of all new kidney failure cases. So it's really something that it, it's it's not that you have it for it's not the initial time you have it. It's, it's the longevity. It's a marathon, right? Mm-hmm. So it comes to the end. It's, it's 10 years down the line with diabetes continue to pound on your body. Right. <laughs> that this really gets a, dangerous. Yeah. And it's a chronic progressive disease that will get worse with time. And the major factor is there is how well you take care of yourself. So you're if right. you're not taking care of yourself and you're having high glucose readings or high A1C readings, and you're not eating right or exercising, then that progression speeds up and it wreaks more havoc on the body and leads to target organ damage or kidney failure, blindness, retinal issues, neuropathy, heart attack and stroke, diabetes. The things that come along with it are, are very, very grim. And uh, we don't want anybody to you know have those sequelae of uh, the disease process. But 
you know, that's why we're on the front lines here of trying to change behaviors and pay attention and get the public's attention about how to treat this. So there are great medications, but it can easily be treated with lifestyle changes, as we say over and over, exercise and nutrition. So, Absolutely. And I think, and just to kind of take a step back, the chronic kidney disease and things like that can also really enhance the hypertension. So really all this is it's like a glove. It just gets worse. You put your hand in a glove, it gets worse and worse and worse. One thing leads to another. And I just want to mention one more thing is, is talking about eating healthy, eating those wheats, not the, you know, not the white breads and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, you don't have to lose a whole lot of weight. We're talking baby steps, just five right. pounds, 10 pounds. I'll, I'll use my dad. I shouldn't probably do that. But he lost 15 pounds and he was pre-diabetic. Now he's he feels great. He's a new man. He walks every day, and he feels a lot better. And really enhances everything. Once again, going back to that, it, your whole body's enhanced. Hypertension's better, if not completely gone. Right. Uh, mentally, you're, you feel better. You're sleeping better. Everything is really improving. Yeah, yeah, it makes a big difference. So our patients that really listen and are motivated and they make changes and lose weight, whether it's you know, 10, 15 pounds or even 10% of their body weight. You're right. It's a small amount. There's big changes and big benefits. Your body really has significant benefits from that. And it's not just compartmentalized, you know, it's not glucose only or high blood pressure only. Our body functions as a highly engineered, uh, high performance. It's, it's very, very complicated and they Absolutely. all function together. So it's not a piece of machinery. It's not engineered, you know, in a lab or anything, but, you know, it is very complicated. And it all works together. So one piece doesn't work without the other. You're, you're exactly right. Um, and this is, these are just small steps to take. I mean, like I said, this is a great conversation to have with your provider. They'll be more than happy to get you to the right people. And just, and just kind of going back to the point, just be transparent. If you have any issues with diet, exercise, whichever, just please mention that. Any West Tennessee provider or whomever would really be able to help you out and get you in the right area. I agree. Yeah, we're here to help and, you know, just have open dialogue and good conversation with our patients. So, so next time, you know, we will have another podcast on We Talk Health. We're going to talk about treatment of type 2 diabetes. There's um, multiple medication regimens out there, uh, and we'll talk about that in more in depth. But I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Pertle for coming on We Talk Health. He is located down at the Lyft Clinic in downtown Jackson. Again, he's a uh, internal medicine trained and has a fellowship at Vanderbilt. We're glad to have him here in the community. And we'd like to thank you for listening to We Talk Health.